Hi, Jenny. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for coming back to speak with me again. Absolutely. So after the last time we talked, you sent me an email and you had a few things that you kind of wished you had maybe elaborated on or thought of after the fact that might have been relevant to the conversation we were having about your experience in school and, and in counseling. So I, I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk some more and, and hear more of your thoughts and experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that comes to mind when I was at the end of my grad program, I was in internship. And at least in my program, when, when, when you're in internship, you have a site supervisor. So that's a person who's fully licensed at the site where you're placed and can help you with your professional growth, can help you with treating clients, case conceptualization, things like that. There was also a school supervisor. So I had a supervisor from the grad program itself. And um, in that particular internship, it was at a private practice. And I had a client who was having some psychotic symptoms, you know, hearing some voices, seeing things. And when I brought this up to my supervisor at the school, you know, she was looking at things very much through a, through a lens of cultural difference mm -hmm. and seeing that the concern I had was almost like my way of not valuing the cultural difference and pathologizing something that shouldn't be pathologized. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I think this is part of the problem when you are primarily viewing things through a social justice lens and you have limited clinical skills you can miss, you can miss some significant illness. And in this particular case, you know, this, this client needed to be hospitalized. She was having some command hallucinations to harm people. She had started rehearsing that, you know, this is pretty serious. It is very serious. And when, when the people in charge, when the people who are in charge of being supervisor supervisors or in charge of education, don't have a lot of clinical skills. They may not know. They may not know the severity of illness. They may only be looking at a case through um, a pretty narrow lens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, they are not going to give good supervision to new clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, as it was, even the site supervisor. I mean, this really should have been a nine one one call during mm -hmm. the session. Um, oh wow! And the site supervisor basically just had the person go home with the promise that she would then go to the hospital. Um, because of not wanting to discriminate or because of some aspects of that person's um, the, demographic So the makeup? person was having command hallucinations okay. to harm people and mm -hmm. she had rehearsed it. So mm -hmm. there, there were some, there were safety issues, mm -hmm. not against. What was her, what was making her, the supervisor inclined to, to not take that as seriously? Um, my client was from a, a different ethnicity. There was mm -hmm. also a different religion. I was concerned that the religion was more of a cult than a religion. And I guess we can split hairs on what's mm -hmm. a cult, what's a religion. Mm -hmm. Um, so those were some factors I think that were coming into play. Okay. okay. Um, and I, I think also, if you don't, I don't know how much experience the supervisor had mm -hmm. with psychosis. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have experience with that, you may not know that it can, like, it can get worse if it's mm -hmm. untreated. It can be really dangerous. There are times when it's not dangerous. I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that there are some people who hear voices or see things, and it's not a command hallucination. It's mm -hmm. just it might be distressing or disruptive. But mm -hmm. this is not the case for this person. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I mean, I remember after I, um, you know, after this person went to the hospital and was admitted, you know, I had every single week, we, one of our assignments was to write a reflection on our work and internship for that week. And I never got a response in my last two reflections, despite it being about this particular client and, you know, what happened. And yeah, it just, it seemed like just not, not good supervision. So it's like the the effort to be culturally competent and to be sensitive to cultural social justice kind of issues sort of eclipsed any clinical training that the supervisor might have had that would have given 
uh, more credence or more paid more attention to some red flags that were going off for this person that there was a serious mm -hmm. issue we needed to address. Yeah, I think that plus, if you do have limited clinical experience, this may also just be coming from a place of ignorance too. Okay. So this is also going towards just basic competence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is, you know, woke ideology and lack of clinical skill can end up potentially being deadly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that really gets, sorry about my dog. <laughs> Oh, oh never apologize Brownie. for animals. <laughs> <laughs> she's a cutie, but she's loud. Oh, honey. <laughs> she strongly <laughs> agrees. Yeah, she does. <laughs> um, she wants more attention. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I think in our last conversation, you were talking about um, the, the amount of time you spent on some of these, these social justice related topics when you only had a limited number of class meetings for uh, what you, you talked about specifically with addictions class, you had mm -hmm. like maybe eight or 10 meetings that you even had, and you ended right. up spending uh, large chunks of that time delving into um, sociopolitical current events rather than mm -hmm. working on those skills. And so this really speaks to that as well, like the Absolutely. lack of preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, when you're a new a new counselor, there's very little that's really going to prepare you to sit across from another person in some of these, with some of these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a big part of that preparation is just doing it, knowing that you have a supervisor you can lean on or knowing you have a supervisor who can observe you. Um, but there are still some things that could be done. Like, you know, if you're noticing if you're noticing certain things, this may indicate a need for a higher level of care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a really good point and a good illustration, a good um, example that illustrates that point well. Mm -hmm. Did you have, and there were other issues as well that you thought of after after we spoke last time that you thought about bringing up? Yeah, I, I remember um, students would really use kind of that um, social justice ideology to excuse some bad behavior. So mm -hmm. there was a there was a male student in my program who would send unwanted and sexually explicit texts to some of the female students. Wow. In in a in a counseling program, this is one of the students who was, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, wow. that's so unprofessional. It is incredibly unprofessional. Yeah. And, you know, I think in some cases we've, we've gotten away from knowing that flirting happens, but this is more than flirting. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, he, you know, he would be one of the first ones to say microaggression because he was part of a marginalized group. Mm. And so he would use that to almost have a, a shield from some of his bad mm, behavior. Okay. So it's kind of creating a double standard in that case. Right. Mm -hmm. Or knowing that if you're if you're part of a marginalized community, you may be able to do some things that somebody who isn't. Like mm -hmm. your behavior may not be scrutinized as much or it might be excused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in, instead of just you're sending unwanted texts to people and you know, at the same time, these female students could have also been really clear. And I don't know, I know of one, I don't know the other, but mm -hmm. the one that I know, I don't think she was really clear with, I don't want you sending me stuff like this. I'm going to block you now and just mm -hmm. be done with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you do have that option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, it's, it's that where it's coming from with him. It's like, I can, I have a blind spot to my own behavior, but I'm quick to call out other people's yes. similar behavior or, or social faux pas. Right. And, yeah. and knowing that this behavior may be excused from other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was something that, that I remember. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of, it sounds like that's relates to the culture of the program. Uh, that it mm -hmm. that was kind of created more uh, was that I imagine that that was more implied than explicit like these this was something you're picking up on but this was never explicitly discussed 
Right. Nobody's yeah. going to say, you know, oh, well, we can't hold Joshua accountable mm -hmm. for things he's doing because he's part of X, Y, or Z group. Like right. it wasn't like that, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it's like, you just, you know. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. And I, I, I was talking with somebody recently and I, I don't think it was you. I don't think it was during our conversation, but I had this moment where I was like, remembering early on in my counseling program when I was, I, uh, it was taking this multicultural perspectives class. And I said to someone, I know what I'm supposed to say and what I'm expected to say, but I don't, I don't feel like those things are necessarily true. And I want to, I, but it was that, that knowing what I'm supposed to say that come that you pick up on from the culture around you, you kind of are aware. And I don't even really know where that was coming from. I still don't even really know, because as I said, I, I was naive to some aspects of this and I didn't really have a sense of this as being a, like a well-formed cohesive ideology at the time. I just felt like these were, um, these were just cultural pressures in, to, think a certain way and conform to a certain kind of thought. And I knew that I couldn't quite get on board all the way with it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. just where does that come from? And, and so that's sort of that culture you're talking about mm -hmm. in the program where you, you can, everybody knows that this person kind of gets away with certain things and has a double standard created for their behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were talking about that, the thing that came to mind was growing up in the Catholic church and going to mm -hmm. Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there were certainly some prayers that we were absolutely you know, taught and we mm -hmm. had to recite in front of the teacher, but there were some things that I think you just learn how to say mm -hmm. and you learn when to say them because that's what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You go yeah. to these services and people say things at certain times in certain ways, and you learn that this is what you do. You just pick up on it from mm -hmm. having it modeled for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, just it's bringing me back to church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and it is, it is very much like a religion, mm -hmm. what we're seeing now. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a belief in a gendered soul. There are, um, there's good and evil. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there is a promise of eternal salvation. I don't know. Hmm. There's definitely eternal damnation if you, <laughs> if you don't believe. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. there's also, um, indulgences that people have to pay or businesses have to pay like allyship and putting up the flags and yeah right or even you know businesses having really highly paid dei consultants those are you're paying indulgences mm, okay yeah that makes sense yeah it's like um we call them virtue signaling now but it oh. does make sense to think of it as indulgences Did I cut out? Just a moment. can you hear me now yeah okay good yeah like a uh, virtue signaling you know, as we call it now, mm -hmm. being a form of indulgences, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know. That's, I, I'm just I mean, sort yeah, of saying that out loud. Is, I mean, indulgence to me is like, you're actually paying money. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that would be like DEI okay. consultants or even some of the charitable giving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but okay. virtue signaling that to me is kind of like, it's like wearing a crucifix around your neck. It's okay. like wearing some kind of religious garb to let Outward people symbols. Know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm part of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Like the, the pronoun pins and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's yeah. That makes more sense. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting way to frame it. The other thing I was thinking of was, um, some of the poor mental health that some of my colleagues have or mm -hmm. had in mm -hmm. the program. Um, and I, you know, I certainly wouldn't expect anybody to have, I don't even know what perfect mental health looks like. Right. We all have struggles. We all have defenses. We all have some, some maladaptive coping skills. It's part mm -hmm. of being human, mm -hmm. but you know, I had, I had peers in my, in my group who, would get triggered in a class and go to the bathroom and self-injure. Oh, wow. That's pretty, um, that's pretty acutely bad. Um, yeah. You know, 
coping skills, I guess. Right. I mean, they're really, really struggling acutely. Mm -hmm. It's not just something that they've dealt with and are working on. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, there were several people I remember who were clearly having some mental illness struggles. And mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody in the program ever talked to them about that or encouraged them to get treatment or even considered the fact that not everybody is appropriate to complete a program. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there was a, the idea I got was that, you know, the school did not want to be a gatekeeper for people who wanted to further their education, which really is a way of the school wants to make money from graduate programs. Mm -hmm. These are mm -hmm. some cash cows. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a desire to, to have some gatekeeping for the vulnerable patients that we work with. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if somebody is going to be a licensed professional counselor, or licensed clinical professional counselor, they need to have at least stable mental health enough to work with people who are unstable and, mm -hmm. you know, are experiencing incredibly painful thoughts, feelings, memories, who, um, they need to, they need their therapist to be stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of people who come into the counseling field or the therapy field um, come to it because of their own either personal experience with, with mental health counseling or, mm -hmm. or with a loved one having had an experience where this was really helpful for them. So we're talking about uh, people who are often have a lot of experience with emotional instability or overcoming maladaptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you say, you'd want at the point of entry into the profession, you'd want somebody to have a pretty good handle on that for themselves, at least for the most part. Absolutely. And so what you're describing is like, really, uh, um, it, you talked about this the last time we spoke as well. There was just not really very much vetting no. for entrance to the program. It's kind of like if you, anybody who wants to come, just come, we're not really going to interview you and screen mm -hmm. for certain skill sets. Yeah. I mean, there, there was some vetting. I remember I had a pre-admission workshop that I needed okay. to attend. It was several hours long. It was, mm -hmm. it was like kind of a group interview and they would okay. give you some scenarios and ask what you would do. So there was vetting. And I do mm -hmm. know there was at least one person who applied and did not was okay. not admitted. So there was some vetting, but there were, in my opinion, there were quite a few people in my program who probably were not good fits for the program, mm -hmm. potentially for the profession. And that this, this should have and could have been noticed and these people could have been helped or, or maybe um, asked to leave until they could mm -hmm. come back at a later time and try again, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that, again, goes towards like preparation and how prepared are people who come out of these programs to actually perform the services in the community that we think of a counselor performing. Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind when I think of this is with social, social justice ideology, there's a, there's a lot of focus on, on lived experience. Mm -hmm as mm -hmm. opposed to, I don't know, unlived experience. <laughs> I, I don't know, but yeah, um, it's a strange phrase, right? There's a lot of focus on that. And this almost like this idea that if somebody has lived experience that makes them uniquely able to serve that population or to work with somebody who has those issues, but mm -hmm. that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've sprained my ankle. I don't know how to treat a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you are part of a group does not mean that you know how to treat somebody who also happens to be part of that group. Mm -hmm. Or just because you've had a certain condition or mental health issue doesn't mean that you are qualified to treat that. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Lived experience is not, it doesn't make, it, it doesn't make you qualified. No, I, I, I see what you mean. And I, I do see that there are times when it's nice to know that the person you're going to be speaking with has 
you know, maybe they've put it out there that they've been through the thing that you're going through because it makes you mm -hmm. feel like you're going to be understood. But mm -hmm. that's not enough for a qualification that that might be a component. And that might be what draws some people to some counselors. But but like you say, it's not in and of itself a qualification. Right. And it can also lead to some blind spots. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if people have experienced something and have gotten through it, they may think that their way of getting through it is kind of like the way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, you could have some blind spots because I had you know, this condition and this is how I recovered. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to bring into my practice. Well, just because something worked for you does not mean it's going to work for somebody else. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to um, think about some other things. I remember, I, I don't know if I said this in our first conversation about being in a continuing ed event for um, working with people with eating disorders and gender dysphoria. Did I mention that? I don't, I don't know if you did. Okay. Yeah. So I work with a lot of people with eating disorders and um, the eating disorder treatment community is, it's very social justice oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember going to a continuing education event on treating people with gender dysphoria. And the presenter was talking about helping people with eating disorders, you know, accept their bodies, come to terms with body changes, mm -hmm. um, nourishing their bodies, having, you know, joyful, mindful movement, and then when we got to gender dysphoria, it was, you know, referring on for maybe puberty blockers, maybe hormones, potentially mm. surgery. And it's mm. like, how, how, how do you hold these two ideas in your head at the same time? Yeah, it's a lot if of contradiction it, there. Right. If when it comes to eating disorder treatment, we really want our clients to to have acceptance of their bodies, to be able to have body integrity and to treat their body well, to nourish their body and move their body and um, really become at peace with their body. That's not going to happen mm -hmm. if you're also telling them, but yeah, you need to change it in these ways. Yeah, I think that's a powerful contrast mm -hmm. in terms of how these things are, are being viewed by the like the professional trainers or the people who are guiding the guiding the guidance for counselors. Um, and that was something that it, it relates to something that James S has brought up when I was speaking with him yesterday um, about how we don't affirm anorexia. Nope. And yet we affirm the sense of, of gender dysphoria. And yep. it it's just it's a very strange thing that we're being led to to be so different about this one aspect of the person and not use the tools that would be used with any other aspect of a person and something that a person's going through. So mm -hmm. it, that's just another illustration of, of that contrast. Right. And, um, you know, there, puberty is hard. And I think, I think that gets completely ignored by, by people who are really, um, pushing some more of the gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. um, puberty is really difficult for a lot of people. And it's probably more difficult now than when I was going through it because we have smartphones, mm -hmm. kids are exposed mm -hmm. to pornography from an earlier age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can compare your body so easily. It's not just like looking at a magazine at a model, you're looking at your peers that have maybe some filters or your mm -hmm. It is a difficult experience to have your body change in ways that you just never really feel prepared for. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think people forget how hard that period of time is and that it is really normal for a lot of kids to feel uncomfortable in their bodies. Mm -hmm. that, that does not need to be pathologized. It doesn't need to be medicalized. It's something that will it will correct itself over time for mm -hmm. the most part, mm -hmm. not always, but for the most part, people go through puberty and at the end, they tend to feel more comfortable with their bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what you bring up about social media and phones and filters and whatnot, it's so true. We have so much more opportunity for comparison 
Mm -hmm. We also have so much more propensity for self scrutiny because we're, you know, creating profiles and there's that selfie cam and you're taking Mm -hmm. in your, this, the self-examination and this focus on identity just creates more pressure to sort of look at yourself in a mirror. And I, I think, um, I, I think of it more like in terms of narcissistic pressure Mm -hmm. rather than introspective pressure. You know, it's not examining who you are and the content of your, your, your personality and, and who you want to be in the world when you engage with others in a meaningful, substantive way. It's mm-hmm. more examination of these superficial characteristics and how you fit in. Right. And it, it takes you away from life. It takes you away from finding meaning or joy or pleasure in having relationships, in work that you find fulfilling, in in just being in reality. And that's another thing that I see is this this push to just deny reality, which Mm -hmm. is not healthy or helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of the reason people might trip over their words when they're trying to use pronouns for somebody who is clearly a different sex is because we want to live in reality mm. and it's just this weird push of of trying to I don't I feel a weird push and I don't know where it's coming from but of trying to deny reality or live outside of reality mm-hmm. um, material reality is really important yeah I I felt like that very much in in the counseling program that I've been talking about um with regard to uh, the race discussion. I mean, that really felt like it was being, it was being put to us in these, these stark stereotyped Mm -hmm. sort of stories where if you are a person of this race, this will be your identity formation. This is what your identity will have, will have, (laughs) how, how you will have formed and how you will have seen the world and what your experiences will have been. Right. And, and I felt like, no, that's not, I mean, I can say what, what my identity is or how my identity formed around this. And and it doesn't fit that box. It doesn't fit those, those. And so, yeah, it's a very much like, no, your reality is this and you are supposed to go along with that, or you will face continued pressure and, um, and yeah, you'll be, there'll be pushback until you conform your way of thinking. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing to me that people who are trying to be anti-racist don't see how racist they're being mm-hmm. by pigeonholing people into these categories, by mm-hmm. operating from stereotypes and assumptions. And if you get out in the world and you talk to people, you are mm-hmm. probably going to find that most people are not as racist, sexist, phobic in any way than this narrative is trying to lead us to believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's well said. Mm-hmm. Did you have um, any other observations from um, that you thought of after our last conversation that that you can think of right now that you want to share? There was one more. Um, okay. I went to a, a speaker panel recently and just going back to the race conversation, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I work with a lot of people with eating disorders and in the eating disorder treatment community. And it, it tends to be very white and female. Okay. That also tends to be you know, fairly true of counseling in general, although mm-hmm. I think it's much more white and female in the eating disorder treatment uh, okay. population. And some of the speakers mention, you know, I'm looking out and I'm seeing a lot of white faces and I don't know why that is. And it's like, well, there, there's not a bouncer at the door. <laughs> this, is, this is an open thing anybody can attend. Mm-hmm. Um but if you're only seeing this through a social justice lens, you foreclose the possibility that some people might not be interested in attending something like this, or they might not be interested in treating eating disorders or getting into that for a number of reasons. Well, or they don't want to like, spend their Saturday morning doing this. 
it, it also seems like it's counterproductive to bring that up to the group of people who are present. Like maybe right. there's a panel discussion you could have outside of that. Like how do we attract um, a, a more like just to use the word I, I'm so tired of hearing the word diverse, but I'll use it a right. more diverse group of people to this kind of work. What are how are we ending up with a narrow demographic? And maybe we could be mm -hmm. doing something to promote this work more broadly and to attract a wider mm -hmm. variety of backgrounds. But to to say that to the people who showed up, that feels right. like you're kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it's counterproductive. You're, you're kind of insulting the people who want to be there to listen to you. Right. It's like the teacher who's mad that so many of the students are tardy and is yelling at the people who are there. Yeah. 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 And my guess is eating disorder treatment or eating disorders in general are probably underdiagnosed in some populations. Um, you know, people got very, I mean, eating disorders, it kind of reminds you of the trans thing because it mm. was like, oh, was eating it? disorders mm. was like 80s, 90s, and then we have cutting and now we have mm. trans. And so mm. we have these trends and a lot of them really affect young women. Mm -hmm. um, but when eating disorder treatment was starting to become big, it was primarily young white women. Okay. And so people, when they think of eating disorders, a lot of times they think of that. They don't think of men. They don't mm -hmm. think of, mm -hmm. um, you know, other, other races or ethnicities who probably also struggle with this. And so my guess is this may be a problem that is is underdiagnosed in mm -hmm. some communities. And, and so, yeah, it could be like, you know, maybe just trying to trying to network with with other clinicians who aren't just white and female trying to mm -hmm. network with male clinicians trying to network with black clinicians you mm -hmm. know just saying hi mm -hmm. you know introducing yourself or introducing this particular um organization mm -hmm. and then inviting them to attend mm -hmm. yeah As that makes sense just i'm looking out and i'm seeing a lot of white faces what yeah. are we going to do about this yeah I don't know. I can't change my face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry um, about my face. <laughs> what a way to make you feel unwelcome. Yeah. And, and yeah, it kind of, that kind of goes back to what you're saying. If it, if there was a tendency to have a prevalence within that demographic of that particular diagnosis, then you would be seeing people who grew up having more exposure to at least the concept, or maybe they experienced it themselves. Maybe they experienced a mm -hmm. diagnosis or, or a close friend or family member. And so maybe they've got a little bit more of that personal experience with that, mm -hmm. with that particular disorder. Mm -hmm. And that would attract them to working with that population later. So that makes sense that, that there's lots of factors that could be explored as to why that is. Right. And and I think social justice ideology really narrows our lens. It does because that whole concept of the critical consciousness teaches mm -hmm. you not is racism a factor here, but how is racism a factor here? Right. How did it manifest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, yeah, that's not a healthy way to view things because no. you're always, if that is how you view things, if whether it's racism or sexism or homophobia if you're always thinking it's not did it exist but how did it manifest you will con mm -hmm. consistently feel aggrieved you'll probably mm -hmm. feel paranoid mm -hmm. you're probably going to go into conversations and you might subconsciously be making things uncomfortable it's like that projective is it projective identification or projection i can't remember which one but you you think somebody's going to treat you in a certain way. And so then you, you treat them in such a way that brings that about, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then you can feel justified in your mm -hmm. righteous anger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like the saying about if, if you're a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Confirmation yeah. bias. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think these are things that need to be, that need to be broached definitely in counselor education programs also just, you know, in the field, mm -hmm. potentially even with clients. Yeah. We all have, we all, we're human. Mm -hmm. We're going to have confirmation bias. We're going to project. We're going to live in denial. Sometimes we mm -hmm. all have this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it does, it just still strikes me as so strange and so incomprehensible that we're 
teaching these ways of thinking to mm -hmm. counselors. It feels like a weaponization of the counseling profession in order to inculcate this way of thinking in the population ver via the counseling interaction. I agree. And it's in education too. We're just mm -hmm. in general in education, it's coming mm -hmm. in. But yeah. yeah, it is antithetical to mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, these are great observations and I really appreciate that you came back to talk to me about these things because these would have, they're good additions. It's, I appreciate your, your experiences and your analysis of them. Is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, my guess is there are some people who are watching this who may be in a counseling grad program right now, or they're working in the field. Um, some potential things to check out would be Gender Exploratory Therapy Association or GETA. If you're interested in working with people who have gender dysphoria or who are questioning some gender issues, this is a group that can help you to, to really just do exploratory therapy with that population. It's not conversion therapy. It's really just basic therapy. It's getting back to a psychological approach to psychological problems. There's also Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. They have a podcast. Um, you know, a lot of times when I when I've tried to bring up some of these issues in the past, people will then respond with, oh, so you think racism is not a problem? You think homophobia is not a problem? And that's mm -hmm. not at all what I am mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. um, we can agree that there's a problem and disagree about how to go about with solving it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also critical therapy antidote. I think you and I talked about that that last time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another organization if you are in this field getting involved with that, um, watching conversations with Benjamin Boyce, watching the Glenn show with Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter, mm -hmm. um, really just being open to exposing yourself to information, especially information you don't 100% agree with. I think that's really important. At the very least, you can develop some skills to be resilient and to to be okay with hearing things that you don't agree with, because there were many people in my program who were not okay just hearing ideas they did not agree with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a human in this world and have relationships, that's going to happen. Yeah, especially if you're going to hear difficult things from, from your clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in general, very good advice. And those are excellent recommendations. I'll put links to all of those recommendations below our video. So if people are interested, they can follow those. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate speaking with you again and you taking the time to share. Me too. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>